Amen. Keep your place in Luke chapter 12. We will get back to there in a few minutes, but we're talking about, um, we're continuing the If I Were the Devil sermon series this evening with part um, number four tonight. So we've gone through three parts. We're talking about uh, Paul Harvey's um, essay from the 60s and going through each of the um, each of the parts of the essay and seeing it was an essay on you know the state of our country and if I were the devil the things that he would do to bring the United States down and we've stepped through um, the essay so far we've talked about how the devil has corrupted the churches in the United States we've looked at how the devil has corrupted the Bible the Word of God and caused people to doubt the Word of God in this country and we've looked at the media and how the media has just desensitized us to sin in this country and has just pulled us away from the Bible and just this, the media just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and making us less and less and less sensitive to sin, which is the opposite of what um, the Bible will do, by the way. So let's continue this evening. And uh, this evening is a little bit different. And one of the things that you're going to realize when we do the book series and we do these, um, these, these sermon series on these other essays, look, these essays and these books that we do sermon series is on they're not the Bible, so they're not going to be infallible. And as a matter of fact, the next paragraph that I'm going to read you and we're going to preach on this evening, Paul Harvey had wrong. He didn't understand. He, he misunderstood this next part. So let me read this um, next portion of Paul Harvey's If I Were the Devil for you this evening. Quote, if I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. So Paul Harvey here is talking about the family, the churches, and the nations, and the division that exists within those things. He's talking about divisions within families. He's talking about divisions within churches. And then he's talking about divisions within nations. And he's saying, if I were the devil, I would cause these divisions, is what he's saying. And I'm going to show you this evening that he actually had that wrong in his essay. I'm going to show you this evening, we're going to talk about division this evening. We're going to talk about where it comes from, why it exists, how, how are we supposed to handle it? How are we supposed to handle Division. Look down at Luke chapter 12 and look at verse number 51. Many people have this wrong today. And this is one of those things that is super easy to slip into, to fall into. Because you know what? It sounds nice. It sounds, you know, to embrace our differences and to all come together. It sounds like a good idea. But let's look at what the Bible says. Look at Luke chapter 12. And look at verse 51, towards the end of the chapter. Paul Harvey, he was seeing a problem, but he misinterpreted the cause of the problem. He missed it. Look at verse number 51. Jesus says, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. There is a fundamental misunderstanding today about division. Look at verse 52. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son. Now we're talking about division within a family here. And the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Look, the Bible here is telling us, and this is what Paul Harvey had backwards, is that it is not the devil that brings division. It is not Satan that brings division. It's Jesus that brings division. You say, but, but peace on earth. Peace on earth. That sounds good. We'll go, go to Luke 2 in verse 14. We just talked about this. It's such a great time for this sermon, too, during the, the Christmas time and the holidays. Look at Luke chapter 2 in verse 14. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, this is the Christmas story right here. This is the angel talking to the shepherds. We just looked at this. Glory to God in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace. 
goodwill toward men. Look at it. Well, peace on earth. Peace on earth. Isn't that the goal? No, let's read it. Look at what it says. It says, on earth peace. What does that mean? It means goodwill towards men. God's goodwill towards men. That, that is the coming of Jesus Christ was God's goodwill towards us. This was not talking about world peace amongst men here. This is talking about God's peace towards us. The opposite of John 3.36, which is God's wrath abiding upon us. Instead, God sending Jesus Christ to reconcile man to himself is God's good will towards us. It's the best will that he could ever have towards us. So, I mean, what about peace, what about peace amongst men? Isn't that a good thing? I mean, it seems kind of, turn to James chapter 4. It seems kind of messed up that, you know, we would, especially when the reasons for war are, are bad, why would Jesus be against peace amongst men? Look at James chapter 4. I mean, the Bible even tells us in such great detail, the Bible tells us why men go to war. The Bible tells us why there's war. So you're like, why did this war happen? And you study history. Why did they, all war is because of this right here. In one way or another, all wars because of James chapter 4, look at verse number 1. From whence come wars and fightings amongst you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? So, look, the, this, is, this is why uh, two men war with each other. This is why two clans war with each other. This is why two, you know, nations war with each other. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and ye cannot obtain you fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. He's talking, then he talks about asking. But look, land, money, you lust for things. Power, resources. You don't have things. One group doesn't have things, and they, they, they go to war. That's what they do. So why? So war is caused by the lust of man. So isn't peace amongst men? I mean, shouldn't that be? I mean, that sounds great to say that we should all be at peace. But here's the thing. Peace between men was not Jesus' goal. You have to remember that, and I'm going to show you why. You have to remember when people, because like people throw this stuff out at Christmas time, in the holidays, at Thanksgiving, just peace on earth, we all need to just you know love each other and all come together, and people are going to throw this stuff at you as if this just, we all just need to be at peace with everyone and everything all the time. That was not Jesus' goal at all. Jesus' goal was to, to show God's good will towards men and to provide a way for us, man, to have peace with God. That is why Jesus came. It is a matter of peace between whom is what you always have to remember. Go to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37. Remember, look, remember our universal truth from this morning. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, where Jesus said, Then he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. This is the problem right here. This is why there will never just be this peace amongst all men. It's because there's always going to be a harvest, and there's always going to be the laborers. It's not like we're ever going to achieve this point where we're all just, we got them all. And we're all laborers now, and there's no more harvest. This is a universal fact verse 37, that Jesus was talking about. And then he says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he sends forth laborers into his harvest. So Jesus here is saying, because there's laborers and because there's a harvest, this is why, and I'll get into more detail on this in a few minutes, this is why there's, there can never be peace amongst men. That's why Jesus wasn't for it. Jesus was never here to bring peace between men. And it, it, there's laborers, and there's a harvest. So, Jesus here explains in Luke chapter 12, he's like, look, I'm here to bring division. I mean, the Bible tells us, and I've preached on it over and over and over again, that we need to be separate. We are to be a peculiar people. Come out from among them and be ye separate, the Bible says. Look, in order for us to be separate, there has to be a dividing. There must be a dividing. So like as the world changes and as the world gets worse and worse and worse, the dividing is going to have to get more and more and more. I mean, you think about it from the perspective 
of churches. We talked about this in one of the parts of this sermon series. Look, churches in churches today, there, there should be division. You say, why? 99% of churches have a false gospel. So look, the moment a church starts preaching falsely, there should be division there. The problem, the problem today is that people will not divide. That's the problem. Look, all these false churches should be empty if people were following the Bible. If people were following the Bible, all these people would have divided from the false church. That is what Jesus causes. And anybody that is following Jesus will be divided. But that's where it's gotten us today. People did not divide. So look at the state of the churches today. I mean, imagine. I mean, look at families. Look at families. Imagine going to visit relatives over Christmas time and not attending church at the Catholic church that they go to or the Lutheran church that they go to. You know what? That, you're going to be called a divider if you do those types of things. You are going to be looked down on, and you're going to cause division. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. But guess what? This is such a great time to talk about this topic as well. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. Look at Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 17. Because look, families, within, within families, when I'm talking about families, I'm talking about people that you're related to by blood. You know, cousins, uncles, aunts, parents, brothers, sisters. But look what the Bible says in verse 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Look, here's the thing. You say brothers and sisters. Why, what, what is the Bible talking about here? Brothers and sisters, they grew up together. Shouldn't they just be on the same page with everything? It's like, why wouldn't a brother and a sister just be on the same page with everything? But look, people grow up. People grow up, and they adopt different cultures. You know what they do? They marry different people. And they, 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 have, they end up with different beliefs. They end up with a different culture than their, their brothers and sisters, they, even though they all grew up together. Happens all the time. Then there's situations where there's issues when they were growing up that cause issues you know, when they're later in life, and there's hard feelings. I mean, maybe somebody was treated badly when they were a child by another sibling or something. Things their parents did. Look at the Bible of parents that favored children. Don't ever favor your children. I mean, if you, if you favor one child over another, maybe you even don't even mean to do it. You make sure that if you give one child something or you treat one child a certain way, that you, you on purpose do that with all your children. And you will cause them. That's a, that's a cause for division amongst siblings. Look, they're going to have plenty of other causes of division. But don't give them reasons. But look, there, the point is there's going to be a lot of issues between siblings. There's a lot of division. The Bible is telling us that in Proverbs 17, 17. This is never going to change. All right? Other than obeying your parents in Ephesians chapter 6, other than obeying your parents, by the way, unto the Lord, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, other than obeying your parents unto the Lord, there's really no special treatment given to your blood relatives in the Bible. That's a hard one for people to understand. That's a hard one for people to act out and, and follow in their lives. But that is the case. I'll show you more about it in a few minutes. But you're just not going to find this philosophy in the Bible that you are just to not divide from people because of Jesus, because they're related to you. That's what Proverbs 17, 17 is telling you. It's telling you that, look, it's just, just because they, there, there's no special treatment for that. That's what, that's what Proverbs 17 is saying. So families, and Luke 12 is saying the same thing. Jesus right away, he says, I'm here to cause division. And then he goes right away to where the, the hardest division is going to be, right in the families. Father, son, mother, daughter, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law. He just goes into the whole thing. So families are going to have division, and guess what? Jesus will cause it. Jesus will cause that division. Go to Acts chapter 17. So we see Jesus causes division in families. Jesus should cause division in churches, but unfortunately people just decide to not divide, and we see what happens to the church. Look at nations. 
Look at Acts chapter 17. Now, look, everybody has race wrong today. We have to get, we have to get the definition of race in the Bible, according to the Bible, correct. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Look at verse 26. The Bible says this. In verse 26, it says, And he hath made one of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their inhabitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So this is very interesting right here. First of all, there's many nations. There's many nations. But guess what? All the nations, nation is what most people would call race today. The, word, the Bible uses the word nation. But, you know, there's only one race, the human race. The Bible never talks about anything to do with skin color or, you know, the, there's an African race and a European race. No, there's none of that. It's, it's many nations, one blood, one race. That is what the Bible says. And look, and it's a, any one of these nations, if they seek the Lord, they can, he can be found. That, that's what the Bible says. All right, now look, turn to Numbers chapter 9. There's many nations, one race. And really, you know, really what the Bible is talking about when it talks about nations it's still not talking about skin color. That's just stupid. That's just stupid. What it's talking about is culture. What it's talking about is culture in the Bible. And this is where the division comes in, and there should be division amongst cultures. Look at Numbers chapter 9. Even the children of Israel, if there was somebody from a different nation, then I'm going to show you that that means culture. You know, the nation had a different culture. That was the whole problem. It wasn't because he was a Hittite. It was because of what culture the Hittites had. It was because of the Hittites' culture. Look at Numbers chapter 9 and verse 14. Because if somebody came from another nation into the children of Israel and they accepted the culture of the children of Israel, meaning they accepted their God, they were to bring them in just as, as anyone else. Look at Numbers chapter 9 and verse 14. And if a stranger shall sojourn among you, means stay among you, and will keep the Passover unto the Lord. See, that's huge right there. Basically what he's saying is, is that this stranger, if somebody comes from another nation, and they adopt the Lord, they, they get saved and they worship the Lord, and they give up their pagan culture, whatever they came from, according to the ordinance of the Passover and according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. Ye shall have one ordinance, both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land. Basically saying that if somebody comes in, look, if somebody comes in here, they get saved, and, you know, look, they're just one of us. That's it. That's what the Bible is teaching here. And this further backs up Acts 17, that it's, it's talking about different nations, different cultures were the problem. Okay? Color of skin had nothing to do with it. It's, 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 uh, it's idiotic. It's not, in, it's, not in the, it's not in the Bible. It was about the culture of following the Lord. Following the one true God instead of all these pagan cultures. That was everything. That's why they weren't supposed to marry amongst them. And they were supposed to be, what? They were supposed to be separated. They were supposed to be divided from these people. It was all about their culture. The stranger had to conform to God's culture, and then they were one of the people. That was it. So look, here's the funny thing. All cultures are not compatible. All cultures are not compatible. And the reason is, the reason that there has to be division, turn to John 14. The reason that there has to be division. Because here's the thing, folks. If everybody comes together, look, somebody's, gonna, somebody's changing. If you're over here and I'm over here, and we're supposed to come together, somebody's got to change. And it's always the Christian that has to change. Just to, just to, you know, just to answer that for you. Look at, but... But here's the thing. All cultures are not compatible because of this. John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, you've probably heard this a million times. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, that's great. But then guess what? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I, I mentioned that out soul winning today. Look, there's no other way to go to heaven. There is no other way than through Jesus. The Buddhist, the Muslim, the whatever, they may be the nicest people in the world. They may be your neighbor. They may be 
They may, they may have nice kids. They may have, look, there's no other way to heaven than through Jesus. That's why Jesus is the divider. Because that by itself. So that's why we can't put aside our differences. Because that is the, that's a universal truth. There's only one way. And it's through Jesus. You know, isn't that what we're told today, though? Put aside your differences. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Ultimately, but here, here's, here's the answer. Here is the answer on why we can't put aside our differences and why they're always, here's, here's the answer to why there will always be division for the Christian. This is why right here. Okay, this is the base reason. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 14. And ultimately why peace is Satan's philosophy, not Jesus's. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Okay, so there it says, believers and unbelievers are not to be yoked together. Okay, there we go. Let's, but he just continues. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? So we compare believers and unbelievers with righteousness and unrighteousness. And what communion? Now we go, what communion hath light with darkness? Now we see light with darkness. So we see believers, unbelievers. We see righteousness, unrighteousness. We see light, we see darkness, but really it comes down to this right here, the last verse. What concord have Christ with Belial? Really, it's, it's Jesus or Satan. That's what it is. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Look, there must be division because, here's why, there must be division because Satan and Christ both exist. That's why. That, that's it. Let's pray. That is why there always must be division. But it is Christ that calls. We're not done, see? There will be division because Christ and Satan are both real. And Christ is the only way to heaven. But it is Christ that calls for the division. This is super important. It is not Satan saying separate from Jesus. No, it is Jesus saying divide. I came to divide. I came to divide you out. This is Harvey's misunderstanding in this part of if I were the devil. Because the devil, turn to Jeremiah chapter 6, the devil is the one calling for peace. The devil is the one trying to get everyone to come together. It's Satan. So when you hear this stuff that tickles your ear, come together, find middle ground, embrace our diversity. That is Satan. That is not Jesus. You must remember that. Look at the prophets. Look at the prophets. Go to Jeremiah chapter 6. What was Jeremiah doing? What was Jeremiah doing? Jeremiah was going into this nation, and he was just saying, destruction is coming. He's like, destruction is coming. We're all going to die. They're going to invade us. He just Bad news, bad news, bad news. He's like, destruction, war, destruction, war. He's like, we're going to be invaded, and we're going to lose. I mean, imagine the, 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 the prideful, you know, Israelites who are like, oh, our, we're the best nation under God. And he's over there, You're gonna, we're going to be invaded, we're going to lose. Look, this, he was not popular. He did not have a popular life. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. You should underline that in your Bible. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of thy daughter of thy people slightly, saying, meaning they're telling them something that makes them feel better slightly. It makes them feel better like right now. We were talking about that with junk food earlier. Junk food kind of makes you feel better, like, right now, and then later you're like, ah! Oh! And then even further out later, you're like, oh, I have heart disease. And then pretty soon you're like, oh, I'm so unhealthy, and then you die from junk food. But right away it makes you feel better. This is verse 14. They've healed also the hurt of my daughter, of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Imagine, imagine a huge army coming towards your city. 
Just, but the army's like, you know, they're like two weeks out. I mean, you could spend two weeks of enormous stress being like this huge army is coming to destroy this city. Or you could just have people, peace, peace, everything's fine. And for 13 days, you could just, you could be healed slightly, but then you're going to be destroyed. So they're saying peace, peace, but guess what? God was angry. There was no peace. There was no peace. Look at verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, and here it is, therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I, this is the Lord, that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Look, these people didn't want to divide. They wanted to continue. They wanted to continue in peace. It's the same today. This is us today, right here. Verse 13 through verse 15, this is us. They didn't want to divide. They just wanted to say, peace, peace. They just wanted to continue the way that they were continuing in their abominations and their nation. They just wanted the nation just to go on. Why? But the problem was what? God. That was the problem. That was the problem. So coming, look, coming together, common ground, always means you going to them. That's what it always means. Look at verse 13. Why, why did they say peace? Why did they say peace? Here's why you underline that. Because every one of them is given to covetousness. Because they just kind of wanted to go along. They were making good money. They were kind of living this good life. This is why you're going to see, this is, you're seeing this in our country today. Yeah, look, people are going to put up with stuff. People are going to put up with mandates. They're going to put up with wickedness. They're going to put up with perversion. They're not going to cause trouble. As long as they can just keep their, their little life going that they've got. People are going to sit there and they're going to make themselves a bubble. A bubble in verse 13. And they're going to just, just keep to their covetousness. As long as I get mine. That's what's happening today. That's why men, that's why even unsaved men that know all this perversion and this homosexuality and all this garbage, they all know it's wrong. They know it's wrong. They're like, they got mine. I got mine. I got to protect mine. But guess what? It's all coming down. It's all coming down. They'll just accept things to keep their comfortable life. But get, it, it, it's, it's going away because of verse 15, I will visit them and cast them down. The Lord says, the problem is God. The problem is God. That's why it doesn't work. That's why there must be division. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The last days, look, the last days will be no different. You want to know, like, you know, we were talking about prophecy and, you know, I mean, the thing with prophecy and end times prophecy in general, just, it, it's just kind of like, it's going to be no different than the things that we've seen except worse. I mean, you, you know, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to sit here and invent all these new things about Bible prophecy because it's basically going to be the exact same thing that we've been seeing except worse. But it's the same patterns. It's the same thing. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse number one. But of the times and seasons, he's talking about the end times. Brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say, what, look at this. When they say peace and safety, then this is, this is the guy telling you peace and safety when the army's two weeks away. You're going to believe him until day 13.9. And then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Look, the last days are going to be no different than what was happening in Jeremiah's time that are what's happening in our time. It's not going to be anything new. It's just going to be worse. This is why there must always be division. Now, look, I don't know if Harvey knew that the division that he was beginning to see I think that he probably knew that the division that he was beginning to see was a sign of a falling society. Because that's kind of the theme of his essay, If I Were the Devil, is just that this society in the United States was falling. But guess what? He, he just he missed the mark on this one because he put division into his essay. But here's the thing. The division itself that he was seeing is a good thing. It's a sign, because look, as the society falls, what we have to worry about is when the division stops. 
is when the division goes away. The division that Harvey was seeing was a, was a physical view of God's remnant because Jesus causes that division. So we need to embrace division tonight. I mean, why, I mean, why in the world would we be discouraged or shy away from something that Jesus was for? Think about that. He, he literally said he came to bring it. Look, whatever, whenever Jesus says, I came to bring, I'm like, I want whatever that is. When Jesus came to bring something, we need to embrace whatever the next thing is that he says. And he says, I came to bring division. Look, and here's the thing. It should be something that we're for. And it's really, a, it's really like a sign of biblical maturity, of Christian maturity. And it's a sign that we're following the correct path. You know, with our families, our churches, and guess what? Our nation. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. Just remember, let me show you who's trying to bring peace. Let me show you who's trying to bring peace. Just remember, it is Satan that is trying to bring peace on earth. Remember the sermon on convergence. He is the one that is trying to converge everything. He's trying to converge morality. He's trying to converge organizations. He's trying to converge everything. Because guess what? If everybody converges together, that means that people don't really believe anything. And everything's up in the air. Look at Daniel chapter 9. It is Satan himself that will ultimately bring peace on earth. That will bring peace between men. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And look, this is a sad time because any time that there's this massive peace amongst wicked rulers, it means that the remnant is either small, silent, or both of the Christians. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Turn to Exodus chapter 23. This is talking about the seven-year peace that the Antichrist will, will bring in in Daniel's 70th week. This is, you know, end times prophecy. It is the Antichrist working for Satan that will bring this type of world peace. Look at Exodus chapter 23. But God, God has always been against this. Look at verse 32. Look at, look at, and I could, I mean, we could read dozens and dozens and dozens of verses like this. But Exodus chapter 23, look at verse 32. Talking about the, you know, we're talking about the Antichrist making a covenant with as many people as he possibly can. He's just out there. He wants to make this huge covenant. Exodus 23. Look what God says about the nations surrounding Israel. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. He's like, no, there is no agreement. There is to be only division. God said make no covenant. There is no compromise between the Lord and the godless and the pagan. There is no compromise between Christ and Belial. There is no middle ground. There must be division. Division is from Christ. Unity is Satan's game. Don't fall into it. Don't fall into it. Look, the, go to Exodus chapter 32. The holidays are especially bad for this. The holidays are especially bad for this. It's when, you know, everyone comes together. Everyone comes together at the time of the holidays. And we're going to put aside our differences. We're going to let the kids play together. We've been, look, we've been down all these roads. We have been down all these roads. We're going to embrace, we're going to embrace our diversity. Look, that is the dumbest thing ever. It makes no logical sense at all. We're going to embrace our differences. Look, if you are here and I'm here and we will both leave our positions like neither one of us believed where we were. That's what that means, just on a logical, a logical level. But look. Just remember that Jesus is the one divider that will cause all other divisions. Please do not forget that. Now, go to Exodus chapter 32. We had the golden calf incident where the people, they started worshiping, you know, they left the Lord and they started worshiping a golden calf after Moses was gone for just a few days. And the people leave the Lord. And look, God is angry. God is angry. And God calls Moses and Moses puts out puts out a challenge to the people. Look at verse 26. 
After Moses comes down, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and he said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And, yet, and look what happened. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So this is interesting. You know, my wife, my wife actually has a theory that this is why, because this is before the, the tribe of Levi was chosen to be the priests. And my wife has a theory that's as good as any I've ever, ever um, you know, heard. It's, got, it's, it's, it's very valid, in my opinion, that this is, this is one of the reasons, at least, that the tribe of Levi was chosen to be the priesthood. Because, look, they were, look, who's on the Lord's side? Levi was there. Yes, they were Moses' tribe. I get that. But look what he says. He says, who is on the Lord's side? And the tribe of Levi shows up. But then look at verse number 27. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Now there's two points I want to bring up here. He says, who's on the Lord's side? And he, what does he do? He causes division. And, and they divide to the Lord. And then he says, you know what? And this is a hard truth right here. This is a hard truth that a lot of people have a hard time swallowing. That's why I told you it, it takes Christian maturity to swallow this pill. But this is the Bible. What does it say? It says, they went out and they slayed every man his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Did it say, uh, give your brother a break? Was it related to him? No. There was no, there was no quarter given to family. You know, you know what the division was? It was who went to Moses and who didn't. That's it. And the people that remained, it didn't matter if they were family. It didn't matter if they were friends. It didn't matter if they were neighbors. What mattered was they weren't on the Lord's side. There was no, that's a hard truth that people need to swallow. That Christians today need to swallow. And here's the next one. Here's the next one. Think about the sides. What did we just, what did we just sing? We just sang one of my favorite songs. You know, we're, you know, we're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. You should go out and you should listen to um, Curtis Hudson's sermon where he sings, I'm on the, win you know, I'm on the winning side. And I'm telling you, he, he, saw, he sang that, that song in a sermon just shortly before he died. And if that doesn't move you, you don't have a soul. Well, let me tell you something. We're on the winning side, but if God showed up today, which side would he see you on? Which side will your kids see that you're on? If you can't swallow the pill of point number one, you have to recognize this truth. It's a hard truth, but guess what? Learn it and embrace it. Learn it and embrace it, and let me promise you something, because this is, this is the side that I've passed through. Your holidays, your Christmases, your Thanksgivings will move from stress to joy. That's what will happen to you. And guess what? You'll be on the winning side. But make sure you're not just on the Lord's side with your mouth and the things that you say. Make sure that you're actually over there. And, and that's, that's what you need to do. Because look, folks, Christ brings division. He tells us that. Look, it's, it's an easy thing to say. It's a hard thing to do. I get it. The Word of God. One person follows it. Others don't. But guess what? They're offended by you following it. There's the division. If, look... I follow the word of God, you don't. Whatever, right? No, wrong, because they're upset that you do. So division is the answer. It must be the answer. That's why Jesus brought it. That's why Jesus is for it. And that's why Satan is against it, because he wants you stopping the division and going over there. But then guess what? You're on the wrong side. You're on the wrong side. So Harvey saw a problem. He, he put his finger on the wrong culprit. Jesus is the one causing division. When we see division today, thank God for it. That means that there's still men that are standing up. And they're saying, you know what? 
I'm on the Lord's side. I'm not for this. I'm, I'm not going together. I'm not coming together in all this garbage. Like, I'm on the Lord's side, and I'm going to stay divided. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.